what is the sharing economy and how would you define the boundaries of it? You know, most people think of it as you've got you've got something that it, you can make available to others um, and make a profit from it. And the boundaries I think that are are most people are most concerned with are the the legal implications, the taxes, what does it mean to the incumbents and things like that. Um, but if you take Uber, for example, I was in the first round of Uber, and to me, it's it's not even in the sharing thing because it's like there's a, no one's sharing the limo, it's just that the limo is available and it's putting somebody to work who's currently sitting on the side of the street looking looking for more work. But, uh, but it's making a huge impact, obviously, on an incumbent and changing laws. So it's um, it's going to be interesting to, to see what happens with with everybody. And I think the key is that, like everything, like Priceline did and like Amazon did, but paying taxes, um, there will be a balance that everybody will strike. It's certainly not going to go away at this point. You know, I don't, right now, we're seeing, at least in our business, that there aren't that many boundaries. I think there's big question marks around insurance and um, sort of structuring these companies and, and how we approach that. But from an idea perspective, and whether you're looking at sort of a micro economy or something that can reach um, globally, there's ideas coming out of, you know, just pouring out of the sky in the sense of folks that have either thought of an idea in the last couple of years and haven't had a way to power that, or um, are anxious to get involved in this new way of commerce. And so for us, we've kind of been calling it collaborative commerce to get away from the word sharing, and re-commerce as a way that peers are connecting with each other um, across any level, or a brand is connecting at another level with their peer. So you know, from a boundary perspective, I think that um, there might, there's challenges with governments, and we're starting to see folks like peers and other folks try to um, push towards um, the movement and breaking down a lot of those walls of you know, what's keeping some of these companies from growing and from growing in the next level, whether it's Airbnb or some of the small startups that we work with. Um, so I think the limitations are definitely around insurance and legal aspects of it. But anybody, and we're trying to help that movement, is that anyone can come into this new collaborative world of, of sharing at a you know, small level within a community or at a global global presence. So we're, help, we're trying to help scale that. I kind of see it in a different way. Um, I think that you know the sharing economy really, as many people say, it arose in 2008 when there was limited economic opportunities in the more formal economy. And so the sharing economy has been defined as an emerging economy that allows people to use their underutilized resources or their time and whatnot. And as we see it grow and, um, you know, referencing a company like Uber or its, uh, its company that emerged in competition with Lyft, which was UberX, which was the ride sharing component. Um, I think the boundaries that we kind of look at are, you know, are the participants in the sharing economy being benefited uh, across the board? So as, are the boundaries, you know, uh, making sure that participants in the sharing economy are adequately compensated and that we don't see drivers in a race to the bottom for what they make in an economy that they thought was going to be something that was much more in their control? Um, I think there's a boundary in terms of the values. Uh, the whole part of this sharing economy and this, this loving feeling that we all get around it is, you know, in my opinion, this, this openness and transparency, a collaboration, a legitimate, authentic community. And so I think the boundaries, you know, in which we look at the sharing economy can be viewed in terms of the values of it as well. Just, you know, we live in a world right now of abundance. It's not scarcity. It's just that those resources aren't being allocated efficiently or effectively by the market. Um, so shared resources, but um, and also shared access. You know, so um, lowering those barriers to market to entry for individuals who want to be starting their own businesses or to be, you know, driving Lyft or whatever. 
just figuring out um, how can more people may create their own livelihoods uh, for themselves and not be dependent on others, but also shared um, ownership. So we're looking at um, uh, shared ownership structures, uh, cooperative organizations and cooperative businesses, um, and uh, cooperative housing, those types of things to really uh, try to figure out the, the boundaries of the sharing economy and start to look at it from a values perspective instead of one of uh, just sharing resources. Are local grassroots movements compatible with big business? And if so, how? Well, I think in terms of the sharing economy success as a whole, um, the grassroots movement is going to be critical for any of these businesses at any stage to grow. Um, the marketplaces that, are, that people can create online won't gain traction if people don't understand what sharing is. And I think taking a step back from the technological aspect of it, you know, we've been sharing, it's part of human evolution. Um, so in terms of current businesses like mine, you know, Supper Share thrives when more people understand what the sharing economy is. When sharing as a whole is communicated similar to like grassroots in terms of political movements, you know, you are more receptive to information when you learn it from a friend, when someone knocks on your door, when you're at a social organization and someone mentions something that raises this familiarity. So for any of these businesses within the sharing economy to survive or to thrive, for the movement to grow, grow as a whole, um, I believe that the grassroots is integral to that. Um, and that if we don't have that really strong foundation of community support, then any sort of offshoot of the sharing economy in which big business comes up with will fall flat because it won't have the air behind the sails for it. I think it's a bigger theme. I think maybe this all is becoming so prevalent because the, one of the, the key factors is trust. And there are so many great mechanisms to, to prove trust now, or at least to identify who you are and get feedback, um, whether it's a Facebook plugin or, or better rankings that didn't exist 10 years ago. These are all prevalent in, in these systems. And I, I think the big brands also realize that they are losing that trust. So for example, when I, I was in Australia a couple of days ago, I just don't want to stay in the Four Seasons. I stayed in the Four Seasons one night and it was completely boring and drab and I prefer to stay with the local. So the second night I, I was in an Airbnb in Bondi Beach and had a great local experience and, and because I can trust the resources and the feedback that was on there, I'm going to work with them or I'm going to, I'm going to stay there and, and I think it'll just continue to see more more of this where these companies start at a grassroots level um, around a new category but then begin to partner pretty quickly with, with big companies. I definitely think that the trust and community are synergistic in that um, the more community that we start to see thrive within the ecosystem of the sharing marketplace that we'll see trust kind of take off from that and it'll push out all of the negativity out of the platform. So we're working on a lot of trust-based tools that kind of go hand in hand with community. And I also believe that community is something that you know, from a grassroots perspective, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer basis is really all around, um, it's beyond ratings and reviews. It's how do your peers see you online. And so we're really focused on that. It's not just on a five-star rating system. It's what else can you receive and give to your peers. When we're looking at um, big business, um, it's like a very qualified yes, you know. Um, we look at, uh, for, for what we conventionally see as big business, then most of the time it's no, you know. They have a bottom line, and that's not to create community, it's not to create access, it's not to create shared ownership, it's to maximize profits. And what's that, that mean? It means taking money from the people who are producing the wealth for that company. Um, but if you're talking about being able to scale something with shared ownership, you just have to look at Mondrigo in Spain or the Medio Romano um, cooperatives in uh, Italy where you have um, tens of thousands of worker-owned businesses working together in networks to combine their um, impact and also to uh, corner parts of the market become efficient enough to compete on a global scale. 
So when we're looking at big businesses here, we need to just ask those types of questions of, are these really creating better community or are they just co-opting a grassroots led movement that um, was built on certain values and then was bought up by larger corporations? Brands are recognizing that their customers are the community. It's like another phase or deeper phase of social media. So where social media kind of was able to ignite that and involve the customer in the conversation, in the brand, and include them in that whole sort of transaction, um, this is just enabling that at a deeper level. So whether or not transactions happen online, for us, we're working with really large brands that are saying, hey, look, we want our customers to stay under our umbrella and under our brand and understand them better and push them off to this marketplace to do whatever it is they do, whether it's buy, sell, trade, swap, exchange. So for us, we're seeing that the brand isn't really looking at it from a transactional perspective entirely, um, especially folks that are in marketing, social media. Um, it's a deeper listening tool and a way for them to gain um, an understanding of what their customers want. Just some examples of that I think um, that we can talk about are Cisco is really interesting. They're, we're working with them. They have a developer marketplace of about 5 million developers around the world. And they're really focused on giving back to the community and empowering those developers to connect via their WebEx on skill sharing. So folks that are in second, third world countries or other parts of the world that want to become Cisco certified can connect on, on the marketplace that's powered by Cisco. So, that's you know just one example of a completely you know community focused marketplace that exists right now um, by a big brand that has nothing to do with them buying more equipment from Cisco. So I think it's possible. What values, if any, do you think are unique to this movement? I think that uh, the sharing economy has a lot of values, but they might not particularly be unique to only the sharing economy. They you know the sharing economy didn't come out of a vacuum. It came out of all these different um, you know, systems that we were living in. And so people chose what values they liked from the previous systems and things they wanted to see change. So they want more community. You know, they want to be able to provide um, lower entries to market for, for individuals to have their own livelihoods. They want to be able to leverage the technology that exists to not have to, like, um, be under a boss anymore. Um, so the values that is that are part of the sharing economy, I think, um, are part of others. I think I, I have a tough time with it being called a movement. It's um, for me like I stayed in a youth hostel twenty years ago when I was backpacking, and there were ten of us in there, and it was just a less expensive way for us to share a space. It was like thirteen bucks, including bacon and eggs or something like that. And I just think it's a much more efficient way to do it. And so people have been doing this and wanting to do it, and then with the downturn in the economy, it's become it's become um, more important to do it because it's putting people to work and it's putting more income in the pockets of those who are offering their services or their space while making money, you know, while saving money rather for those taking advantage of that. So um, I don't want to a bunch of company names here, but just as, as an example, there's a another company I'm involved with called Peerspace, and I'm sure there are many others like Desk Near Me. I mean, it's literally keeping people in business because if you've got a, a space and you're teaching voice lessons and your rent is 3,000 bucks a month, um, and it's hard to make that rent, if you can rent it out for 2,000 bucks a month, then you can pay the bills. It's not really a value, it's just becoming, people are more comfortable with sharing their stuff. And, and I don't necessarily think that's a value, it's just the level of comfort that people have reached and it's just more, it's, it's more of a norm, a social norm, than a value. I would disagree slightly um, in that the, what differentiates the sharing economy from any other economy, in my opinion, is the values of it. Um, you know, in the 80s, there was a, a, you know, we've seen an evolution of the me, 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 own more, uh, you know, uh, having property is, is just a, a, a luxury or an ornament on my life tree for everybody to see, 
And then the economy came crashing down, and we realized that we needed a little help from friends. We needed to share a bit. That we wanted independence, but in many ways we were in interdependent on one another and sharing what the resources we had. And that's where a lot of these, you know, if you listen to Brian's story of starting Airbnb, it, it came down to not being able to make rent that month. There was a design conference in town. The, there, they, he had eleven. He had one thousand dollars in his bank account. His rent was one thousand one one thousand one hundred and fifty. So his friend said, "Why don't we use our space and, and put it up for this design conference?" And they created an airbed and be was the first iteration. A lot of these companies have emerged out of times when people realized they really needed somebody else. And they turned to the internet because technology allowed them a, a quick way to build a platform to monetize it. And then we got on the sharing roller coaster, which has spawned a whole industry, which is really wonderful. Um, and now we're at this intersection where we're talking about grassroots and big business because um, it's, I think, in many ways, remembering, you know, yeah, so I think we're at that intersection now where as, as more of these, you know, initial mom and pop companies are receiving $2.2 .2 billion in venture capitalist funding is when we have different conversations about what drives a business and what drives the values and, and whether that changes things. Isn't Airbnb big business now? It's a billion dollar business. So they're doing the same if not more in revenue than a Hyatt, then so we're comparing the foundation of what's led the sharing economy with big business and almost some would say, you know, categorizing big business as equal and, and there's the sharing economy over here and how do the two worlds meet. So I mean they've met in a lot of ways and Airbnb's done a fabulous job of maintaining the value system. I don't want to like portray these big companies as an evil or anything like that. They're doing what they're legally obligated to do. They're legally obligated to maximize the returns for their shareholders. So it's not like a value, it's just what they're like legally built for. What types of business and ownership models do you see as possible now in the future? This is a lot of what um, we work on at Selk, or at least what I work on. We have 10 different programs from rethinking the legal field to um, our food systems to our housing. But um, as far as um, business and the uh, legal structures, um, yeah, moving towards more shared ownership of businesses, which meaning shared returns and um, possibly cap returns for outside investors. So. Um, looking more at passive investment than active, um, trying to get the quickest return on investment, um, which you know might be a little difficult in hyper capitalist like San Francisco, but um, but it's the things that we're trying to look towards and trying to see what can actually create more equitable and just communities. Um, and what we're trying to see, and it's not only uh, worker cooperatives, it could be producer or consumer, whoever's generating the value. So we're actually working with a client called Loganomics, and it's basically, um, it's, it's been described as a task rabbit if all of the rabbits own the company, right? So um, basically what it is, it's a platform for freelancers to sell um, their services through and schedule the, the services through and the money passes through. And so the company takes a portion to, you know, as operating capital, but at the end of the year, um, the profits are distributed based off of the usage of the platform by those, free, by those uh, service, or the, the freelancers or the independent contractors. So that's something we see as a potential platform for the next type of business model that is actually creating community wealth and generating local, strong, and resilient economies. We've talked to maybe 1,500 different types of businesses in the last six months, and we've kind of categorized everyone under either goods or services. And under those business models, um, we've seen everything from uh, sharing of um, volunteer time to um, typing and maid service, um, developer time. So almost these sort of niche markets that come out of what might be on an Odesk or Elance or TaskRabbit. And then also goods, really underutilized assets, RVs, boats. What we've noticed is that everything else underneath that, whether it's a service or a good, is just a function of a platform and a function that makes that business thrive. So whatever the model might be, 
um, they all need certain values and standards and we're trying to build that into our product offering. A lot of what we're seeing too is just um, from a brand perspective, they come to us with a, a certain idea or look to us for that leadership on how they can get involved in the sharing economy. So working with folks like Patagonia who originally started working with eBay, um, we're working with Cisco, Telefonica, a lot of other big brands and um, their models, just it just fits right in with whether it's a current service-based business or goods. There's one thing that I haven't seen that I'd love to see that I think could be done now is that a company gets crowdsourced, the whole thing start to finish, shared ownership, and the whole thing kind of like a co-op, kind of like Rainbow Grocery. Um, and I think one of the companies that's closest to that, which I'm not involved with at all, except I know the founder, is Quirky. And they crowdsource products, and everyone gets a piece of the action from the designer to the production, or everyone who contributes to the design and the feedback of the thing. I'd love to find something like that. I would say that in terms of business models, you know, shared ownership, cooperatives are certainly a, a thing to explore. Something I would love to explore with my own company, um, and in doing so, we would need to explore other alternatives to investment. So that's a way of looking at impact investment as a bridge to grow while you're looking to build a cooperative company. So there's some alternatives to uh, other fund funding mechanisms, um, and then just in terms of the business model, I'd just love to see yeah all the participants that are a part of it being able to, to make ends meet and not, not feeling like they're locked into a system that's not working for them anymore. I think it would be super cool if Uber drivers or Lyft drivers or Airbnb hosts, if they all got stuck in the company. I'm, I'm not sure how you can do that. I don't know if you can do that because they're not employees, but if there is some mechanism to allow that to happen, I think it would just be so cool. Then, then you're yeah. kind of talking values, I think. It's like a lot of these questions around like, are they employees and those type of things are um, issues that itself is doing research on trying to figure out how do we how do we like navigate existing law but how do we create law so that it allows people to be able to do these things um, it doesn't create undue burdens on either the company or the workers themselves but yeah and, and talking about um, crowd crowdfunding and those types of things is something that uh, we're really passionate about as well is how can we get community owned um, you know stores or businesses in our communities and there are lots of regulations and laws that basically stop anybody from owning any equity in their local businesses because you have to be making over such an amount and there's um you know these regulations are there for a good reason they're put in place after um, the great depression when everybody had their money in the stock market and there was no thing no such thing as an accredited investor and so everybody lost their money and so these laws are put into place to stop people from replicating that situation but now we're seeing like with crowdfunding um, that more people do want to take ownership in their communities and do want to be part of um, investors and, and have ownership in, in their community businesses. And what we're trying to do is figure out how do we um, start chipping away and creating a little bit of a, a niche in, in the legal system to allow people to do that within their own communities without putting um, them under such a risk that they're going to lose all of their, their money and all of their future you know, wealth if this business doesn't thrive. So these are like legal questions that we're trying to figure out itself. You're investing in a co-op, in a T-Corp. And uh, at the end of the day, because you put in a significant portion of the upfront capital to make that company happen, uh, you would take a dividend at the end of the day as opposed to having, having an exit or an IPO, uh, or an acquisition or an IPO, I suppose. How would that? How might that look for you? Yeah, possibly. The, I, I guess I'd have to know more about you know, what the upside is compared with the downside. But slower distribution. Slower distribution. It's, it's a good question. I mean, it, it's funds are ten-year funds typically. You go into twelve um, with some extensions. So if there is some way that if there was a, a mechanism or an agreement with the LPs. I've actually got amazing LPs, so they would probably say, "Go for it if you think it's the right thing to do." Um, then, then I could I could look at it, but without understanding like the specifics more. But it's possible. But it would be I think it would be hard for I'm an early stage VC. I don't have I, I have mostly wealthy individuals in the fund as compared to pensions and things like that. I would imagine that they would have a more difficult time doing something like that. Thank you.
your opinion, is there anything that should never be part of the sharing economy? Anything that harms children? <laughs> we have some controversial ideas from the Cross Life Light, so we kind of have an internal like, motto of anything that harms children, babies, or animals. Yeah, so um, part of this internal conversation itself is to create some uh, definitions around what we believe should be the sharing economy is, um, you know, creating this definition and, you know, different points, um, whether it's shared access, shared um, ownership, um, whether it's creating a generative return for the, um, the community, those types of things. What we're thinking about possibly in the future is publishing these internal documents externally and saying that these are the, these are the values and these are the, um, like, uh, points that, the, that companies should aspire to, and if they don't meet, you know, a majority or something of, of these values, then they shouldn't be calling themselves sharing economy companies. What are the biggest problems that you foresee in the future with the sharing economy? The governments in, you know, on a per city basis, especially for some companies that are trying to be, go global, and they're having issues in certain cities and other governments and, and having to tackle that on micro level is, is a problem for growth, it's a problem for, you know, bleeding into other areas throughout the world. Um, so I think that's, you know, most of these laws were written, you know, centuries ago, and I think there's there's a need to kind of revisit that and, and rewrite some of these to uh, jive well with all the different sharing economy companies. So that's one of the biggest things I'm seeing just globally across the board. Um, for example, you know, Spain, um, you know, certain cities in the States, we've met with folks that actually want to set up a marketplace off of Airbnb, kind of fight the, the local government, um, so to have their own Airbnb through us, where they can still drive and drive bookings and have an online presence. Um, we're seeing it like small communities throughout. There's one right outside of Detroit that's contacted us, um, parts of Spain. Parts of Europe where it's bit, even bigger movement there, but, but there are some governments that are, are shutting everything down there, whether it's car sharing, bike sharing, just all things sharing. Yeah, um, the, in addition to that, the other, I don't know where the question came from, I guess it doesn't matter. Where, where should I put? Um, in addition to that, the, the things that I am concerned about when I look at a company and just generally I'm concerned about are health and safety. So if it's you know, a food company, for example, on the beastly and whatever it is, if it's if it's got the potential to impact health and safety, then I want to take a good look at that. And there are good reasons why there are government regulations, um, and that's one of them. And you know, whether it's safety in, in a ride-sharing vehicle or the quality of the vehicle, the quality of the driver, I think those are all important. Um, the incumbents and the power that incumbents have is something else and not just the, the regulatory piece of it but just the, the power of the incumbents I think is an important thing to think about and something that could kill a good potential company and idea from, from growing into, into a big company. What sectors lend themselves or don't to the sharing economy? I just am looking at one right now that's um, there is some great Docker on demand type apps where you can, you know, I have two kids, eight and 11, and I have to bring them to, to the emergency room for little little minor things. If I can get do a video share and, and get feedback, I think that's um, that's a good example of a healthcare one where there, there is literally a doctor on demand 15 minutes at a time. I'm not in that company. And there's one I'm looking at though that is elderly care. It's not, it's, it's kind of like first level elderly care, uh, it's not emergency care, but I think there's some great, some great opportunities really in, in healthcare, as long as the, the training matches the delivery of the service. I think if you, if you pretty much take that and apply it to any industry, any industry could work. I am involved in a, a company that grows lettuce in um, old shipping containers, which is an excess 
of inventory. I didn't, didn't think I'd be in anything like that, but we can do it much more affordably. You can do it greater, cleaner, it's naturally organic. So I, you could go on about the industries of, I'm sure Ms. Michelle and Adam see many more than I do, but I see a hundred a month that I'm completely surprised about that I never would have That note with Dust and Lee, we've seen um, Dust and Lee's one of our clients, and, and we've seen uh, medical spaces share their space. So there's been a lot of question around um, what emergency or issue can come out of that. But they're you know experts in their field, and they're willing to open up equipment and excess space. So we've seen medical field um, open that up, hair salons, um, and beauty. And um, as far as like marketplace specific. We've seen quite a few around healthcare. Adam, you probably um, you just talked to a few that were around healthcare. If, if we're talking about um, the sharing economy that, and one of the values of shared ownership, then there's a great example in New York, the Home Care Associates, where there's 2,300 home care uh, professionals, and it's a worker-owned business. So, um, you know, creating more access to ownership for people who are in these industries that are typically exploited, right? So you have the Eric Mendy Bakeries here in, um, in San Francisco, in the East Bay, in Marin, and what you find is that they make two to three times more in uh, wages um, than the regular baker. So when we're looking at um, like home care and those types of things, um, you know, creating more um, businesses that are actually working around within those industries actually distributes the profits more equitably and creates better livelihoods what sort of uh, environment does a sharing economy thrive in apart from the ones where the urban environments obviously from a from a geographical standpoint because you've got a closer proximity of people near each other so that enables sharing to happen with less friction a fun buzzword we like to use um, but some interesting things that we're seeing like in places like Ann Arbor um, they, yeah, so Ann Arbor is really championing a sharing, um, the sharing movement in terms of skill shares, um, food sharing, health sharing. I mean, they they've got yeah they they work we worked with Shareable to to really get a lot of different things going, time banking, and it's really exciting at a community level. And this is why I think the grassroots is so important for you know bringing people into the fold and that sharing the economy of it, the I bring something to the table, you bring something to the table, or maybe I'll bring something this time, and you'll bring something next time, or maybe I'll bring something and you'll give me some money for it. You know, it's all variations of sharing. Um, when you see things like going on, at, like what Ann Arbor is doing, and really focusing on building a, s a series of different programs that, that are in the umbrella of sharing, that aren't necessarily the next great tech company that Mashable is gonna write about, but they're gonna make a real difference in the community. And I would love to see more uh, less urban environments, you know, embracing that, and that's where we need more people to kind of take up the idea that it may not be as sexy as an app, but setting up a time bank, you know, you need to build a website, you need to get your resume together, you need somebody to tutor your kids, you know, how can when we talk about sectors of where you know we can go into? I would love for local governments to, you know. I would love for there to be a fund to create. Kelsey asked me what I want to see the sharing economy doing in 10 years, or where I want to see the state of sharing at one point in, in time when we talk. And I would love, you know, every local government and community to have some sort of repository, ideally technological, where they can find all of their shared resources, be it time, uh, skills, property, and it doesn't necessarily have monetary value attached to it. But that's going to be a different venture entirely. But Ann Arbor is doing a great job. Urban cities are really incubators for this. Um, but without the grassroots, I don't see it going outside of the urban cities. I think there's, um, I think there's some great examples of like true sharing economy value, but that actually makes sense to me when you apply it to this <laughs> name. Um, but there's some really great, I don't know the names of the companies, unfortunately, but there's some really great micro micro finance stuff going on with mobile payments. I know you could probably find a lowercase capital is an investor in one of them. Um, and that's like just true grassroots stuff where people can afford to buy the 
products that are used to make goods that are then sold on Etsy, for example. And the goal is that hopefully they get paid back. You know, I'm, sh I'm sure there's a big business there somewhere, but it's really grassroots. And then the best example I've seen is the is Burning Man, frankly. I mean, the tree sharing economy is really about bartering. And there's no better use case of that, so if you have a business, go. <laughs> yeah, just to touch on governance, um, you know, as them being kind of a blocker issue that I mentioned earlier, we've actually been approached by the city of Madrid to spin up a pop up um, marketplace, peer to peer marketplace for the World Cup. Um, it didn't happen in time, but they wanted to power up a marketplace around homes that you could go that had huge TV that you could all gather around. So um, we love the idea and I really wish it would have worked. But um, but I think there's room for, on the grassroots level, to even do short-term pop-up type marketplaces. Where can the sharing economy thrive? Is what I, I think there's just so many areas that it could actually thrive and it's just that there needs to be enough buy-in and there needs to be enough of a, like a tip, and we need to reach a tipping point for it to be able to scale. Um, so for example, Tomorrow, um, Self is putting on a conversation on democratizing urban land use and trying to figure out how do we create um, governance structures or accountability structures to to really like protect the commons, right? We all we heard about the tragedy of the commons for years, but then Eleanor o Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, talking about that actually that doesn't actually happen the majority of the time. That people when they come together to protect the commons, you find over and over again that the commons do get protected. And so what we need to do, though, is set some structures in place um, to be able to do that instead of the constant enclosure of private property in this example. Um, another one is uh, next week we're having a conversation on childcare co-ops and how parents who don't have um, the time or the financial resources to you know, pay for somebody to take care of their kids, how can they come together as a group of parents to provide shared um, child support for each other so that the parents are, you know, they can go and have a job a couple of days a week um, and somebody else that they trust is in their community can, can do that. So there's just so many areas and it's just figuring out how to get these people together, maybe at events like this, but, um, and, and basically to convince enough people to, to buy into that, um, that project. Which is going to be the more predominant company? I think there's a place um, for both the consumer and the producer to figure out where they should should have the ownership or should have the access. Um, and it's just trying to figure out uh, whether it's a business or whether it's uh, a common resource or whatever it is to figure out who actually is benefiting or who's producing the value, who's receiving the value, and therefore who is obliged to have a responsibility to, to move forward either to protect it or to produce something or whatever it is. So I don't think it's mutually exclusive, um, but at least that um, self and uh, for myself, like seeing more of these like community-owned resources or community-owned businesses or worker-owned businesses, whoever's generating the value should be the ones that get that return on their value. As an investor, I think that both sides of the equation share that value, and that's why there's such huge opportunity, and it's also why the incumbents and the governments might not love it because the, let's say, a big hotel chain is used to distributing that value to shareholders, um, alluded to that a bit, and now that value savings on the, on the buy side and earnings on the sell side can share that value. So I, I think that's more of what's going on rather than one or the other side. Benefiting. The companies, now the companies such as Uber and Airbnb, etc., are at present taking a pretty significant piece of that value. Um, but that's a that's a third party. I just think it's interesting the disruption of you know I think we're kind of moving to different models of how we interact as a society and you know when we think about this sort of ownership consumer. You know, the lines in terms of the sharing economy, it's the idea that, you know, you have something, I have something, but we're all equal in many ways. So one of the things I really enjoy about getting in the front seat of a Lyft driver's car is that 
I'm sitting in the front seat with them, and we're riding together to where I'm going and having a conversation as opposed to me sitting in the back and relegating them to driving me around. So I think there's also just a different dynamic in a lot of the ways that the sharing is working. You know, when someone comes and stays at my Airbnb or my home when I go out of town, um, if I'm downtown when they come in, I'll say, meet me at the Powell Street Bart. You know, we'll take the bus together, and I'll give you a tour of the city on our way to the apartment. And it's not like someone's coming to a hotel and handing them a key. Um, it's me saying, hey, welcome. And so I think there's just a different dynamic in, in the process. How does this world start to look as you start to look at those problems becoming more real, more people engaging, um, and more people engaging without cash, not being able to, to you know, wanting to barter? No, that, yeah, that's a really interesting question, especially from communities that don't have um, that much cash available. Uh, we act, we've we uh, worked with the Mission Asset Fund here in San Francisco, which basically um, uh, create tandas or lending circles. And, um, you know, it's basically when people come together and they have a little bit of money, but they pool their money and, it, and one, you know, each month or every, every such period that they decide somebody can draw on that money and they repay it. And it's because of that social cohesion that sort of backs up them being able to repay it back. Um, when you're talking about startups um, and bartering, there's actually one here in the Bay called Bay Bucks, and basically it's um, a business-to-business -business exchange for, um, so if a business has excess capacity and uh, they nobody's gonna buy, say, their coffee or they're a um, attorney and they wanna uh, barter or sell their goods through this Bay Bucks, then you can use this online virtual currency to be able to buy and sell you know, and it's it's <laughs> it's not really bargaining, but it's being able to share that excess capacity that you weren't going to be able to do anything with, and you don't need U.S. dollars. So what happens is, all right, go to Baybucks and they'll show you how it gets started. But basically, you're given uh, a loan, you know, at the beginning, a, some a certain amount of funding from them in this virtual currency to start the exchange, right? And so the more that you exchange on this virtual currency, the more that you're going to gain. Um, and actually. So it was um, part of a campaign that yesterday got Governor Brown, or it might have been this morning, Governor Brown actually signed into law, or signed out of law, the restriction on virtual or alternative currencies. So actually, up to yesterday or today, it was totally illegal for any other currency in California to exist except the U.S. dollar. And now that is no longer the case. So. Um, <laughs> so, but basically it's just trying to figure out how do we create these alternative currencies that are allowing for barter and more exchange, more exchange that happen in our communities where the U.S. dollar doesn't really fit in because, because people just don't have it. The, the, bigger, the biggest problem with bartering is the probability that you have something that I'm looking for right now is just super low. You know, when there are like 15 things that a villager might want from another villager, the probability is pretty high that you could swap them leather beard for fish, but the odds of us being able to swap something peer-to-peer -peer is so unlikely that you need this thing in the middle that creates some sort of value for each of those two pieces. Along with these concerns over public safety, the safety of the people who are sharing, um, the people who are receiving and giving up on those ends, um, with the um, lawsuits that are going up against Uber and Lyft and you know with the um, fatalities that we've seen in the accidents um, and something you know very serious at the end of the day somebody's going to pay right so it's trying to figure out who is um, who is going to pay who is liable and that's sort of the really murky area that we're really trying to figure out um, because for example, Uber might say that's a contract employee, I believe they're probably contract employees, so they might say we're not responsible, and then the driver might say I'm poor, uh, so it doesn't, doesn't seem to me to necessarily have to pay. No, somebody's going to pay. Somebody, they, yeah, somebody's going to pay, because if it's a, if it's, so let's say if it's a, um, and uh, 
Just to preface, I am not an attorney. I am a legal apprentice. I'm becoming an attorney without going to law school. So, um, <laughs> but um, if it is a if it's a criminal suit that's happening, um, it's not. There's no individual coming after you. It's the state. So the state's going to make sure that somebody pays. Um, you know, these are like these are very interesting questions that um, we are at self trying to figure out how. Who should the responsibility fall onto and those types of things? Because we don't want we want the sharing economy in the perspective that we see the sharing economy. We want it to flourish, and um, and so we don't want regulation to come down and, and crush these startups that are trying to happen. But somebody is going to pay, and it's trying to figure out who should be responsible um, when these accidents occur. All right. Thank you all very very much for coming, and thank you to all the panelists.